So there are 16 interconnected work packages in this um, um, uh, project. This is called ESTIP. And um, there are three main uh, strands, modeling and data. You can see them here. And use integration here. And also the market and strategic planning. So um, the, uh, the, the group that I'm a member of that is the DER or Distributed Energy Resources, MD2. There are other um, work packages like uncertainty and flexibility, supervisory data, weather condition, monitoring, and dynamic modeling. And also on the um, end use integration, there are prox uh, proxy metering, commercial buildings, electrified heating, wastewater treatment, uh, waste, uh, water and energy nexus, uh, and data centers and gas supply. And on the market and strategic planning, there are climate changes, consumer behavior, financial risk, and different kinds of modelings. So you can see here there are 16 interconnected war packages. And each war package is dealing with um, one part of the energy system. The idea is how we can use different flexibilities across different sections of the energy sector. For example, if we can model the integrated gas and electricity network, which are um, in, uh, in nature, they are physically interconnected with each other, maybe we can use the flexibilities that exist in different parts for each other and try to reduce the cost, try to um, reduce the emission, try to help the decarbonization of the energy system and so on. So um, the project I'm going to talk about to you uh, today is uh, mainly related to the DAR or distributed, distributed energy resources. And as I said before, the ESIP project is a multidisciplinary research te uh, team, including power system people, which I'm a power system um, person, and also gas network, climate and weather, residential and commercial building, manufacturing, wastewater treatment, data centers, and market structure. And the other thing is the consumer behavior. So the way the people are reacting to the policies, how the weather condition changes the people behavior and how they um, consume energy is a very important factor. So if you want to have more information regarding this project, you can refer to this website. You can see it here, isip.ie. Then you will find more, more uh, interesting materials right there. The publication that we have in this project and also the seminars and other things can be found here. Maybe you are interested in uh, that project, and so have a look. Okay, the topic I'm going to talk about today is um, how we can deal with different resources in, uh, in a given distribution network. So here you can see an active distribution network. In this specific network, you will see some uh, consumers, the uh, houses here, which are connected to different phases, A, B, C. And also there are some different um, distributed energy resources like uh, solar panels, batteries and heat pumps and electric vehicles or um, some other technologies. OK, so the question is that, um, as you know, the distribution network are not um, traditionally built for uh, to be active. So it means that the flow of energy is always coming from the upstream network. You can see here to the uh, feed. And um, traditionally, we don't have any DG unit in the system. But as you know, um, the, the trend is toward uh, having more distributed energy resources in the system. But um, the, there's also there are some positive points in this regard. For example, reducing the need for um, infrastructure, for example, or um, reducing the emission coming from these technologies. There are some positive things about that. But there are some other technical challenges that we might face with them. For example, um, the voltage profile. One of the most important thing is that when we have DG units in the system, the voltage profile will be affected. For example, if we have PV units in the system or photovoltaic units, during the day, if the um, weather is sunny, then um, we might have some voltage rise in the network. Or thermal rating of the cables might be um, violated. Maybe the more flow uh, are uh, happening in the cables and uh, some other technical problems might happen for the system. And also the transformer loading might be affected. The interconnection between the MV and LV network are through transformers. And the loading of these transformers will uh, affect the life of the transformer. As, as you know, the transformer is a very expensive asset in the system and it's a very important one. So we don't want to damage this um, uh, expensive asset. And also, 
the active losses in the network, which shows somehow the efficiency of the network will be changed. One important factor of the network is the asset utilization. As you might be aware that um, different DSOs or TSOs are trying to um, maximize or um, improve the asset utilization. What does it mean? For example, as you know, um, in traditional kind of planning, the, the assets are built oversized. What does it mean? For example, they are built in a way that they can uh, answer the needs for a long term of um, period. So um, the, the, the idea is how to use the existing assets in a better way how we can um, generate more income from the existing assets without the need for building new assets. I was involved in a project with Airgrid, which is the TSO of, of Ireland. And the project was uh, aiming at uh, how we can um, better use the existing transmission network. What does it mean? For example, if, if, uh, if you are aware uh, in um, Ireland, there are lots of wind uh, turbines. They are mainly uh, connected to the west and uh, south of the country. So the flow of energy is coming from the west to the uh, east of the country, which is Dublin. So the demand are in the east and the generation are, are on the uh, west. So um, that flow of energy should uh, pass through the cables and transmission lines and come to the demand centers. So we might, if we don't use the existing assets in an efficient way, we have to build new lines. And um, you can imagine that it's a very costly kind of um, action. And also another thing that um, is less um, considered is, that, is the public acceptance. What does it mean? For example, if we want to build a new line, we have to put the towers in the field of people. So, and people don't like it. And it will damage the beauty of the scenes. And also people don't like, if they, they are uh, concerned with the health issue of these kind of towers and cables. So they do not allow it. So the best way to um, approach this problem is how to use the existing assets in a better way. This is a very important topic these days within the distribution network operators and also the transmission network operators. So um, there are different technical challenges that we can see here that um, we should somehow address them. Okay, so let's get back to the problem that we were talking about. Suppose we have a distribution network and, um, and these distributed energy resources are, um, if they are not managed correctly, they will create some technical challenges for us. For example, they will increase the active losses in the network or and cause over voltage in the system. So what is the solution for that? Um, the idea is that, um, as we know, some of these uh, technologies are connected to the uh, network via inverter. So in their inverter-based uh, DERs. So the idea is uh, how to use their uh, reactive power capabilities to um, resolve the issues. So in order to have that capability, we have to uh, show you how these capabilities are formed. And um, is it possible to use these capabilities to improve some objective functions? For example, reduce the active losses in the network or reduce the voltage profile and, um, violation of the safe limits. And uh, how, to we, how should, can we have um, the, a flat kind of voltage profile? So you can see here a volt war curve. So here, it's a very simplistic way of showing that. So the idea is, uh, is it possible to sense the voltage at the connection point and find out the best setting for the Q of these technologies, the reactive power of these technologies, in a way that they act in a way that we want. So they call it the VVC or volt war curve of the DER unit. And uh, these uh, volt war curves are optimized for some objective functions. I will show you some graphs and uh, let you know what's happening here. So here you can see here um, um, PQ curve of a PV unit. So if we don't consider the thermal limits of the inverter, then the P and Q can be anything in the space other than the P should be always positive. Okay, so because they are generating electricity. And um, 
if we consider another constraint saying that, okay, the P and Q should always um, be within this dashed line. It means that the um, apparent power of these uh, PV units should be always less than something. So the thermal limits are observed here. Another constraint that is taken into account in practical application is that they do not allow the PV to generate at their maximum value. Why? Because if they uh, generate at the maximum value, there is no space for uh, generating Q. So uh, they will allow some space for um, generating Q or absorbing the Q. So you can see here that they intentionally reduce the amount of P that can be generated from the PV. Okay. So number four is telling us that um, the PV, if the PV is only capable of uh, absorbing the Q, then Q is always a negative number. Okay. And number five is showing you that uh, on number four, the, the power factor can be anything. You can see because uh, the ratio between P and Q can be anything. But here on number five, you can see here that. Um, the power factor is limited to some number. Okay, so we have a power, P, a power factor max, and in power factor control mode, then uh, we cannot generate any uh, any um, random number of Q. So it should be within some specified region. So on number five, we can only absorb Q. Or uh, in case that we allow the PV to generate Q, then we can have the other side of the net, uh, the the graph as well. So you can see there are some levels of flexibility here. And if we are able to use these flexibilities, we might be able to solve some technical issues without building new assets. So it's very important. And we should be able to manage the system in a way, in an efficient way, without spending much money. So um, this project was uh, done uh, with the collaboration of the ESV network, which is the DSO of Ireland and also WIT Vexford Institute of Technology in Ireland and also the UC. Um, here you can see the different levels of the uh, program. I will explain it to you. So there are different number of uh, data is, uh, is required, network topology, uh, different impedances of the network, how um, renewable energy systems, are, uh, uh, resources and sources are acting and also the load how they are connected to the network, which phase they are connected to, the technologies that we have, and also the capabilities of these inverters are also should be known, and the demand profile, the historic value of the demand, how much was the peak, how much was the load factor, how they are uh, um, distributed between different phases, and the historic data of the uh, renewable energy sources. We use them for scenario generation, and give, we give it to a three-phase optimal power flow. And also we will extract at the end um, kind of simplistic um, volt for curve. So what does this curve mean? It means, let me uh, make it a more here. So it's a VVC or volt for curve. It means that if we have a, a DR or renewable energy resource uh, to the distribution network, Based on the voltage of the connection point here, we can understand how much reactive power we should uh, generate or absorb from the network in a way that some objective function is satisfied. So uh, a question might happen here is that um, we don't, as a matter of fact, we might have more than one device in the system. So um, can we optimize each um, device individually or can we optimize the volt for curve of each device individually or we should somehow coordinate their action together? Um, as you can imagine, uh, the, the power system is a kind of alive um, creature. So um, the action of different um, um, sources in the network will um, influence the others. So if some uh, this DG unit is injecting power, uh, reactive power to the grid, it might increase the voltage. But on the other side of the network, we don't need that. We, can, we should be able to be absorbing the reactive power. So the action should be somehow coordinated together. So um, each VVC curve should be uh, tuned somehow um, based on the historic data. And then um, this will work in the network in a way that we want. So, uh, there are two approaches for um, 
coordinating the actions, a centralized one and a decentralized one. So here you can see that we have a distribution network. For simplicity, I have just considered two DERs or distributed energy resources, and they are um, exchanging uh, power and uh, reactive and active power to the grid. So they are injecting, we are assuming that they are a technology that they inject the power to, for example, if we have batteries, they can also absorb power from the grid. Or if we are a kind of PV unit or, for example, a EV or electric vehicle, we can absorb or inject to the grid. Okay, so the question is how we can tune that Q part and how should we do that? The one way is um, sensing the voltage at the connection point and send the voltage to a cloud and um, the VVC, VVC curve that are already stored right there uh, can be used to find out how much uh, Q should, um, we should inject to the grid or absorb from the grid. So the set points are coming from a centralized kind of uh, point or a server or a distribution network operator. So as you can imagine, um, mm, this kind of configuration, it needs um, different levels of communication kind of uh, network. And also uh, these actions should be synchronized together. And um, it needs a more kind of cost. So the, as I said before, these, uh, using the offline simulation, we have to find out how we should train and tune these uh, curves. So as I said, uh, depending on the technology, it can be PV, uh, energy storage system, or wind power, or demand. The profile of the active and uh, reactive um, power of these uh, technologies, we have to generate some scenarios and we should prepare what might happen in the future. Okay, so this is a centralized approach. The approach I was talking about was a kind of decentralized one. So it means that we do the same kind of um, offline simulation and uh, tune the air, as you see here. And also, um, it doesn't need any kind of um, centralized communication system. So they, they will act based on the, their own um, understanding of what's happening in the grid. What does it mean? They sense the voltage at the connection point and they feed the voltage to their uh, VVC curve. And the, that VVC curve, which is tuned for each DER individually, will give you the set point and they will uh, change their reactive power that they are connected. To the okay. So, um, this is the decentralized kind of approach that we have done in Ireland. And we have tested this method in um, different trial sites. And on the left-hand side, this is the EV uh, charging station at the ESV network. And also this is the uh, uh, public library, which has a large battery in it. And also you can see here uh, the pumps. So you might be familiar with heat pumps. It's used to, um, uh, from the environment and inject the heat to the um, house or uh, whatever you want. And it, they are very efficient in the um, heating purpose. Also another um, solar panel uh, and PV station in Port Leash of Ireland. So we have tested these methodologies in reserve project, which was a European project. And it was partnership from Germany and Sweden and different um, European countries. So. We were trying to find out some solution that um, use the existing assets in order to improve the efficiency of the distribution network. Okay. Um, so, as you can imagine, the, uh, these uh, DERs which are connected to the grid at the left hand side of this graph, you can see they are, we have multiple uh, red devices to the grid which are connected via inverter to the grid. And each res device will see the uh, grid as a Thevenin equivalent, you can imagine, okay? So we, there are some uh, different methods that we can extract the values of the V Thevenin and Z Thevenin and theta of that. So these devices will see the grid as a equivalent Thevenin. Uh, the way they extract the data is out of our topic here, but imagine that each, each res is seeing the network in this way. So the question is how they should react to the changes of the network. So how robust are, is the method that we are proposing? 
So these um, Tevana network is um, affected by different uh, factors. For example, if other res um, technologies are in on and off mode, if the network topology changes, the, the these uh, parameters will change, and also the load model, the zip model that we might uh, use for the or um, modeling purpose, if it's a constant impedance, constant um, current, constant um, active and reactive power, or if the capacitors in the network are switched on and off, or if if we have a kind of a step or variable capacitors, if they change the value, the Z Tevenant might change. And also the upstream network condition, if it changes, then it will um, influence the V7 and all other things in the grid. So we should find a way that um, the setting that we put inside the brain of these uh, res devices be able to react um, to the changes of the network. Okay, so the model remains robust. So what we did is um, explained here. So one condition that um, in, uh, on um, graph A is showing you that um, the res devices are connected to the grid and they are not uh, um, providing any kind of reactive power to the grid. The second step is uh, equipping the, um, the res devices with the volt work curves so they can decide better how to uh, change their reactive power to the grid. Uh, the, the next step is what happens if um, one of these devices is uh, facing with failure or inverter or they are disconnected to the grid or something happens to one of these devices. As you can remember, I told you that the, the actions of these uh, devices should be coordinated with each other. Otherwise, it doesn't work in a way that we want. So the best way is uh, doing something that res devices will understand a change is happening in the system. So if the um, parameters of that V7 or Z7 is changing, then these devices will understand that the setting should be somehow adaptive in this regard. So um, what we did is finding a way that uh, providing um, multiple level of setting to the uh, devices. But how can we do that? For example, the uh, suppose, suppose um, only one device might fail in the system. So what we did is um, trying to find out if one of these devices is out of service and then find the op optimal setting for the rest of them. And we did this scenario for uh, every single outage of the inverters, okay? So we found different settings for the device and provided these settings to the device. And um, if the device understands that something is happening in the network, then it will, it will switch to the proposed um, uh, level of set points, okay? So in this way, we can ensure that uh, somehow um, we are robust against the changes of the network. Of course, it's not very optimal. We are losing some precision here. Uh, the best way is we can be able to uh, change everything and control everything from a central kind of point of view. But in reality, you can uh, understand that um, it might be very expensive kind of solution. And sometimes it doesn't work because in a centralized approach, if something fails, for example, communication link fails or a data is not um, coming properly to the uh, center, then we can't decide in an optimal um, way. Okay. So um, the next step is, uh, so that's finished, but I want to discuss some uh, important topics with you here. Um, here you can see that um, engineering and distribution as for planning and operation, we are facing with different level of risk and uncertainty. Let me give you some examples of the uncertainty that we might have in the system. The first one is how the demand will change. We might have um, experienced this during the COVID-19, the way that um, demand profile changes is completely different with what we were expecting. So the prediction tools that we use, uh, which are mainly dependent on the historic data are no longer effective, I can say. So how should, but in reality, we have to make some decisions regarding how we should react to the changes of the demand although we don't know them exactly how much they are. 
So there are different ways of the, uh, modeling the uncertainty. For example, the four of them are listed here. I do have a publication, you can see it here uh, at the bottom of the page. You might be interested to have a um, closer look at that, but I will explain it briefly here. So if we have the um, a stochastic kind of behavior, it means that um, the uncertain parameter is following some uh, probability density function. For example, flipping a coin is um, um, modeled using a um, probability density function. It has a 50% of head and 50% of tail. Okay, and also um, this PDF can be used for modeling the system. But sometimes the uncertain parameter is not following the uh, probability density function. What does it mean? For example, if I ask you how many books are in your uh, library, you can't say uh, exact number because you might not have the historic data of that and that might not follow a, a stochastic kind of um, procedure. So sometimes you use a fuzzy kind of um, uh, modeling approach. So you define a membership function. You say my books are between zero and 1000, but it's a very vague kind of explanation. You, you might be in a better position to say, okay, my books are between something between five and 15. Okay. So it, it's, it's a more precise one. So using this membership function, you can better decide how the objective functions and also the constraints are satisfied or optimized. Another way of dealing with that is the robust optimization. So in this approach, you say, okay, my um, uncertain parameter is always within a set. You say um, the demand is not exceeding, for example, um, one megawatt, and also it's always um, bigger than zero. So there is a set that you define, uh, using that set, you define how uh, your uncertain parameter uh, behaves. And then, you will find out the worst condition that might happen for the uncertain parameter, which is deteriorating your objective function. And then you will set your decision actions based on that specific number. And also the final one, so, so far you, you know something about the uncertain parameter. Sometimes you, uh, you just have a, a, a prediction of that, but you don't know how much it can uh, get far away from that prediction. So you will make a decision in a way that no matter how much you get far away from your prediction, your decision remains optimal. So it's called information gap decision theory. So it is well explained in this paper. You might have a chance to uh, look at that and see more um, explanation right there. So there are different levels of uh, um, uncertainty modeling. None of them is better than the others. It's only the matter of fact, how much you know about the uncertain parameters, okay? So once I was reading the um, uh, MATLAB explanation for um, fuzzy toolbox, it was a very uh, interesting example right there, which was saying that, for example, a, a stone is coming to your head. Although you don't know the speed of the stone, but it doesn't mean that you can't do anything about that, okay? so. Um, you can say it's fast coming toward your head. So be careful, something like that, okay? So although we don't know some parameters, the exact number of some parameters in our modeling approach, but we still some, have some useful information about them and we can um, use that information for making a better decision. Um, let me explain you uh, some optimization tools that we can use in power system. Um, there are different approaches for uh, modeling the optimization problem, but first of all, we have to know, um, we have to understand the problem we are talking about is what kind of optimization we are talking about. So sometimes it's a single optimization function. We have an objective function, we have a set of constraints. For example, in distribution, function, we want to uh, minimize the active losses in the network and we have to satisfy the power flow uh, constraints in our modeling approach. And um, it's a straightforward. We have to model it in a mathematical way and give it to some solvers and they will solve it for us. The other approach is we have more than one objective function. Objective one and objective two, for example, we want to improve the voltage profile and also the minimize the losses at the same time. Um, I repeat it again at the same time. So we want to optimize both objective functions simultaneously. So in this 
approach, we might need to uh, find a Pareto optimal solution. And for example, we want to maximize two objective functions at the same time. So you can see here, these uh, solutions are uh, located on the Pareto optimal form. Most of you are familiar with that concept, but uh, the idea between, behind the Pareto optimal front is that the solution on the Pareto optimal front is non-dominating each other. What does it mean? It means that the, these solutions are not better in every aspect from each other. For example, the orange one is better than the blue one uh, if we just consider the OF2 because it's, um, for example, smaller than that or um, the, or the blue one is better than OF1 if you want to maximize that, okay? But um, no, orange one is not better than blue one in every aspect. And the same for the rest of them. So in this way, we provide a set of solutions for the decision makers. And we could have done this problem in other way. For example, weighted sum approach. We could have um, weighted different objective functions and sum them together and create a single kind of optimization problem and then try to optimize that. The problem with that approach is that sometimes the objective functions are not summable. For example, the um, example I gave you before, um, optimizing the voltage profile and uh, minimizing the costs. So the voltage profile, it's not easy to be translated into cost values. Or the, um, maybe they are in terms of cost, for example, the cost of uh, purchasing uh, energy and cost of losses. But the problem is the cost of losses is not always paid by the customers. It's paid by the distribution network operator, for example. So the persons that are paying these monies are not the same. So it's not um, um, correct to sum them together and minimize the total cost. So, um, and also if the weight um, factors changes, then we have to resolve the problem. But in the um, Pareto optimal front concept, we provide the solutions and give it to the decision makers. And then, then they can decide which solution to, uh, to choose at the, at the, as the final stage. So if the priorities of the objective function changes, then they can change their optimal solution. Okay. And finally, the bi-level or multi-level Sometimes um, an optimization is coming into the constraints. So we can say the maximum value of the losses should be always less than something. At the same time, try to minimize the um, operating costs. Okay. So different um, optimization functions should be um, identified. And also we should know how the, or the problem we are trying to solve is of which kind. So we can better... Uh, we can find a better method for solving that um, problem. Okay, so there are different kind of optimization tools that we can use. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the MATLAB and Python and MATLAB and, and also GAMS, General Algebraic Modeling System. The first two are um, um, not open source, but they are very strong in solving different optimization problems. And the third one is a, a very popular and um, widespread in the world, in the, uh, which is called Python. So um, here I want to give you some explanation of the, what's happening in GAMS, which I have worked um, in this area. So in GAMS, um, there are some elements in each um, optimization model. We have some data, for example, uh, the network data, uh, how, uh, different buses are connected to each other, what is the impedance between different buses, the sets, for example, set of buses in the network, the parameters, the demand, for example, the scalar, the S base of the system, for example. And also there are some variables. Different variables can be defined into our, our optimization model. These variables can be a, a real, can take real value, can take integer value, can take binary values. For example, if we have an on and off states of different um, uh, technologies in our model, we have to use binary kind of variables. And then we have some constraints. For example, the most uh, important one are the power flow constraints. So we have some level of constraints in our network. And finally, we have to define the type of the model we are trying to solve. Is it a linear programming? Uh, mixed integer linear programming, nonlinear programming. As you can imagine, in the OPF, if you want to uh, solve a proper AC OPF, we have nonlinear functions. 
So NLP approach can be uh, useful in this regard. And also there are other kind of modeling, for example, mixing your nonlinear programming, quadratic uh, programming approach. So, and we will feed these information into GAMS. So what GAMS does for us is uh, translating or mathematical approach for commercial software uh, solvers at, at the back end. So for example, if we have a linear programming, usually it's better to use Cplex solver, which is developed by IBM and GAMS translates or model for the uh, Cplex to be solved. You can also avoid using GAMS and uh, code or model into Cplex language, but we have to learn Cplex or, we, or for example, we can translate or model into um, for Groovy solver then we have to learn how to talk with the Groovy. So every solver has its own language, okay? So GAMS is kind of acting as a translator for us. So we develop our model and feed it into GAMS and GAMS will talk with the solver and gives us the values, optimal values for the variables that we have defined for our model, okay? So I will give you a very quick example here. So here you can see uh, AC power flow modeling. Um, here we have an objective function, for example, we have, um, we have a, for example, a two bus network, which is connected via impedance and there's some, uh, for example, capacitor, for example, and also there, there are some uh, constraints for the balance, nodal balance between the active power injection and the active power extract as a demand, and also the flow of energy in active and reactive terms to the other um, buses in the network. So, each bus might be connected to different buses in the network and the nodal balance should be always uh, satisfied, okay? And also we might have some other technologies like wind, like a PV or anything that we want or load shedding in the network. So here we have to define our uh, optimization model in this way and fit it into GAMS or Python uh, or some packages like Pyomo in Python and they, they will solve it for us. So first of all, we have to describe our model in a mathematical way and fit it into a um, solver, okay? Uh, there are different resources in the um, web or uh, in the literature that you can use. Um, this is my book, the red one, uh, which is Power System Optimization Modeling GAMS. It includes economic dispatch, unit commitment, um, AC and DC power flow, uh, PMU placement, uh, energy storage modeling. Um, you can have a more uh, detailed explanation right there. And also there is a great book by Professor Conejo. And um, this is called uh, Decision Making Under Uncertainty in Electricity Market. It has GAMS codes inside the book. And the um, stochastic modeling is very well explained in this book. I will definitely recommend this book to be read. For you, you will learn lots of th interesting things regarding the optimization under uncertainty. Okay, and uh, that's it from my side. Um, I will be glad to um, answer your question if you have any. Uh, I hope it has been um, useful for you. I will be waiting for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Shorodi, for your nice talk and in depth knowledge which you have provided to our audience so i will ask from our audience if they have any questions queries so they can ask directly to professor Shodi. yeah i i have provided my email here as well if uh, anybody has any question i can um, answer uh, don't hesitate to send me an email so we can be in contact in the future as well but here i we still have time so Please ask me any question that you might have regarding the presentation or any other topic that you might have. Few uh, Hi, Prof. participants Hello? have asked some questions. So sure. I will ask Hello? on behalf of him. So one pass participant has asked that PV will produce fluctuated output. How about the protection setting at distribution network? Does it might have flexible setting, for example, during peak PV output versus during night time? Definitely. Um, actually, um, in modern protection uh, analysis, a, um, different settings of the protection levels are provided to the relays. So the, the relays are operated in a flexible way. 
So, um, uh, for example, it, and also if the uh, condition of the network changes, for example, in distribution network, we, we might have some switching happening in the system. So there are so, some switches might uh, get opened or closed. So the protection settings should be adaptively uh, changed in a way that they are not causing an um, extra technical problem for us. So the, the modern protection um, is dictating us, we have to provide a um, flexible kind of uh, settings for the or relay protections. Yeah, if the answer is yes, yeah. Any other participants who want to ask their question from Professor Shorody can raise your hand. Unmute yourself, participants. Raise your hand. Post will unmute you. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Dr. Shur yep. Dr. Shurudi, uh, yep. one participant had asked one question that what are the parameters we should consider to use existing assets for DER? Uh, for what? DER. DER. Okay. Um, it's a very good question. Um, for example, um, uh, when we talk about the um, efficient using of the existing asset, for example, let me give you an example. For, um, suppose we have a transformer with a given capacity. Um, if we are able to use this capacity in a better way, for example, if we have a, a profile of the loading of this transformer throughout the year, and that profile shows that um, the level of the loading is changing with time, definitely, okay? Uh, the profile might show that only a, a small portion of time we are using more than 90% of that uh, transformer. This is showing you that you are using your asset only for a very short period of time during the year. If we can increase that loading level uh, in a safe way, then we are using our assets in a better way. So, uh, and also we can uh, charge the um, people for interconnecting to the uh, distribution network in a, in a more efficient way. So, because the income of the distribution network operator is coming from the new interconnection to the grid. If we are not in a position to allow people to get connected to the distribution network, then the income of the distribution network operator will reduce. So, um, the question is how we can um, uh, provide more facilities for new interconnection to the grid without endangering the technical safety of the distribution network, okay? So um, the question is how we can uh, choose, or, uh, how we can tune our existing flexibilities. For example, how we can change the ta uh, tap changers in our upstream network, how we can uh, adaptively change our um, capacitor settings. These are the questions that might answer how we can better um, improve the use of um, existing assets without the need for building new, uh, new lines and feeders, yeah. I think Dr. Shurodi has beautifully answered your query. Uh, Dr. Shurodi, another I, participant has asked one question I, that, is it possible to integrate open DSS and GAMS? Uh, as far as I, I haven't done that, to be honest with you, but um, OpenDSS can talk with uh, Python, okay? And GAMS is also capable of talking with Python. So Python can be, a, can be used as a linkage between GAMS and OpenDSS. But one thing I should mention here is that um, whatever you do with uh, OpenDSS, you can do it with GAMS, okay? Uh, I should clarify something here is that GAMS is not a power system software. It's a kind of mathematical tool. So whatever you want to do, you have to write down the mathematical um, formulation that is describing your model. Then GAMS is um, solving that model for you. So if you can uh, model what OpenDSS does, you can uh, do whatever OpenDSS does in GAMS as well. With link to this question, uh, another participant had asked that, can we do EV charging, discharging, modeling in GAMS, how different is it from energy storage model? Um, the, diff the main difference between the, um, the, the main difference between EV modeling in GAMS and the uh, battery modeling in GAMS is that battery is always there, but e EV is not always present. 
So um, one extra uh, element should be added to your model, battery modeling is that you should um, define the availability of the, this specific kind of battery in your model, that this battery is all, only available during some specific hours of the day. That's it from my understanding, but uh, the rest of it is the same. Thank you so much, Dr. Shruti. Will you take more, some more questions from our international Definitely. participants? Sure, sure, please. One of our participants has asked that how effectively we can use swarm optimization for autonomous systems. Um, may I ask you to repeat the question again? I didn't hear you very well. How, how effectively we can use SWA swarm optimization for autonomous systems? Uh, swarm, you said? Yes, swarm. Okay. Um, Heuristic optimizations are very um, a strong way of modeling the um, optimization problem. The, they are very capable of dealing with non-linearities, non-convexities in um, uh, optimization models. Uh, I have, I do have some publications in that regard, but how we can use power, uh, PSO or genetic algorithm or different things in this regard. And there are some um, problems with the, I can see there are some positive points and some negative points using in these kind of uh, techniques. The positive point is that um, you don't have, you don't need to be much worried about uh, the um, uh, structure of the problem. They can solve many kind of problems. And you don't need to be worried about the binary variables or integer variables or the mix, uh, the mixed integer nonlinearity of the problem. But the, 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 the problem with this kind of uh, technique is that um, they take a lot of time to solve and the solution they provide um, is not always repeatable. What does it mean? It means that if you run your problem today, um, you might get one solution. And uh, if you run it again tomorrow, you might get another solution. Um, and also it depends on the number of iteration that you allow the um, uh, problem to solve they always improve and you, you, you don't know when to stop, okay? So it, depending on your computation and um, facilities, you, you might allow the algorithm to run more, in more time and then find the optimal settings. So my opinion is that um, it's not important what method you are using for solving the optimization. Uh, the more important thing is uh, what problem you are trying to solve. Okay, so instead of focusing on the technique for solving the optimization, uh, my suggestion is finding a more important problem to solve. Okay, so these are only methods and the methods uh, should not um, guide your research um, area, you know. So um, try to find out some realistic problem and then try to understand what is the best method for solving that. If the, the problem can be um, modeled as a classic optimization, then Python or MATLAB or GAMS are much better to solve that instead of the uh, heuristic kind of uh, methodologies. And the heuristic methodologies are not, unfortunately, are not well um, accepted by the industry, okay? So uh, my suggestion is um, trying to avoid them, but sometimes it's, I understand that it's not possible to um, only keep with the classic kind of optimization. Now I will request from all of our participants to directly contact. He's a very nice person. He can, he can answer all your queries through your, uh, the emails. Hello? And now I will, yes. Yes, yes, hello, continue, Dr. continue, Dr. Subo. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Ali, Ali Reza. It was a very nice lecture you had delivered. And I have a, I have a question that is, uh, can we model an objective function consisting of voltage profile as well as uh, to reduce the cost of overall system or or we can reduce the uh, losses in the overall power system yeah then um, as i said um it's not easy to sum two quantities that are not from the same type for example the money and the voltages okay so the best way to do to deal with that is uh, using the um multi-objective optimization. In GAN, you are also capable of modeling as a multi-objective and you can find a Pareto optimal solution for that. 
and then um, this approach will provide a multiple solution for your, your decision making it will give it will be in front of you so you can decide uh, if i choose this solution it is better in terms of the voltage profile but if i switch to the other solution it is a less expensive solution okay so uh, the trade off is happening at that stage and it's a much more um, um, better solution for your um, practical purposes. Thank you so much, yeah. Professor yeah. Sorodi. I will ask now my colleague, Dr. Rajiv, to give a vote of thanks. So, thank you very much, Dr. Ali Reja. Uh, it was a really nice uh, presentation. Even many things uh, I have learned from this presentation. I am working in this area since. Uh, last 10 years but uh, i have uh, i was not much aware about the games and uh, thank you very much thanks a lot uh, i should say that um, i have prepared an online course using gams um, mm -hmm. if anybody needs that course um, just send me an email I'll yes yes uh, some participants are very much interested to join this course they yeah. have uh, we... written some questions in the chat box yeah even we are yeah. getting the getting the message to share the recorded video and a similar type of more lectures so thank yes. you very much thank, thank you, you very much it's such a nice thank presentation thank you thank you it's an honor for me thank, thank you very much share the